WLRN Video presents Greetings. Welcome to my interview with Becky Bowen and Nancy Manahan, two lesbian feminists who are also WLRN listener sponsors. Thank you so much, Becky and Nancy who live in Florida in an intentional women's community called Carefree on Carefree Boulevard. Nancy and Becky uh, were reunited in 1990 at an all school reunion in the small town in Minnesota that they both grew up in. And by 1994, they were lesbian partners. And in 2008, they became spouses. Both of them attended Mishfest and both of them have an incredible love for women and women's communities. So please enjoy this wonderful conversation that I was able to have with them on November 27th about their beloved community in Florida. Okay. Hello, Nancy and Becky. Um, Hi, Cecil. Hi, Cecil. Wonderful to have you on as guests on our show, focusing on women's intentional communities. Nancy, would you like to introduce yourself um, to our audience? Sure. I grew up in Minnesota, lived for 20 years in San Francisco in the Napa Valley, came back to Minnesota. Uh, I'm a college English teacher and massage therapist, and I also ran a carpet and upholstery cleaning for several years. And um, my first book, Lesbian Nuns Breaking Silence was a very life-changing experience for me because it was one of the first lesbian books that went mainstream and was the subject of tremendous controversy. Uh, my second book was about lesbian Girl Scouts and it has just been released, re-released this year and updated a bit. It's called On My Honor, Lesbians Reflect on Their Scouting Experience. And Becky and I have also written a nonfiction book together called Living Consciously, Dying Gracefully, A Journey with Cancer and Beyond. And we now live in Florida, nor near North Fort Myers in a community of approximately 500 women, almost all lesbians. And we feel as if we've found our tribe. Yeah. Becky? Go ahead, um, Becky. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Becky Bowen, and I am a retired a small business owner. I have a small company that put together training materials. I have been very active in women's issues. In fact, when I was in college, I was one of the leaders of the Women's Liberation Group at the University of Minnesota. And uh, I, I haven't been that active these days, although um, I, I've been writing a number of um, lesbian books, lesbian fiction books. Actually, this is the latest one that was published, uh, A Light on Altered Land. And uh, um, here at Carefree, one of the wonderful things about it is that we can have uh, all sorts of different activities that we can participate in. And one of them is the Lesbian Feminist Discussion Group. And one of our leaders there is um, uh, Sarah Valentine, and she clued us into your radio station. And we listened uh, sometime last summer and we're just so impressed with, with what you're doing and the people that you had on and we just love, love your act your uh, actions. Thank you so much. That means a lot coming from a couple of authors. That's <laughs> fantastic that both of you are writers. When did your first book, Nancy, come out about nuns that rocked the, the, the world and was controversial? That was in 1985. Mm. And, and uh, an updated version came out from Bella Books in 2013. Nice. So are both of you, you, you continue to write. You just published something, Becky. You showed us the cover, some yeah. lesbian fiction. Yes. 
so when you publish a book, does your whole community start reading it? And, you know, a lot of people do. And we, we usually have a publication party where we invite um, people to come and we'll give a reading. And we have a number of authors here. Um, and so that's uh, we have a, a writer's group. And that is one of the things that uh, happens periodically is we'll have a pub party. So I've got a new book coming out in uh, February. And that's a, a mystery. Actually, I don't have. Oh, actually, I've got the, I've got the cover. It's, it's not in hard form yet. Oops, excuse me. It's called the Santorini Setup. So yeah, a mystery. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a mystery that takes place on the island of Santorini. Wow, very cool. Let's talk a little bit more about your community. It's called Carefree. Yes. Right? And I was looking at the website and I was hard pressed to find the word lesbian or the word woman, but yet all the pictures of the people <laughs> are women usually coupled up. So, um, but I think I seem to recall that when I first went to your website a few months ago, um, there was mention of lesbians. Has something changed? Is, is this a sign of the times or? Uh, I don't think the website has changed. Mm -hmm. I don't think it ever has said lesbian, but, but as you mentioned, the pictures make it pretty clear that that's what this hmm. community is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you, what, why do you think it doesn't say the words woman or lesbian specifically and just shows the pictures? Well, you know, we live in a very conservative state, in a very conservative county, and it's possible that it was a decision that to kind of fly under the radar. Yeah. And, um, I'm not really sure why that is. <laughs> Um, I haven't looked closely at the website for a long time, so. Uh, right. I mean, lesbians in today's world, as in the past, need protection from mm -hmm. male violence, male harassment. And that's maybe why there's no mention of the word lesbian on the website. I certainly don't get the feeling from you that there's any shame being expressed at carefree um, <laughs> community. It sounds like you have some fantastic other women there that you spend time with doing activities. What are, what's the age range of women living there? We're probably pretty representative. Becky is 69, I'm 75. There are women here in their 50s and women in their 80s. A lot of women are still working, teachers, librarians, medical professionals, uh, computer people, and they either work in the community or they work from home. So uh, lawyers who can amazingly work remotely, especially since COVID. So there are still a lot of full-time and part-time employed women here, mm -hmm. but the majority of us are retired. Are there any children in the community? Right at the moment, no, but often children or grandchildren will live here for a time, um, a year or several years, and go to school locally. Huh. Sometimes, sometimes parents are here. Right now, as far as I know, there are two widowed mothers of carefree women who live in their own homes. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, one, one lives with, with her daughter and her partner. Yeah. Hmm. And occasionally a father or a brother will live here, too. Oh, OK. That was going to be my next question. Are men allowed to, to walk the streets of Carefree and, and, go, and visit in the houses and, and be yes. in the community? Yeah. Both of my brothers have been here to visit us. Uh-huh. Yeah. Are there any women only spaces, though, within the community, like at a community center, like women only meetings, like your lesbian feminist discussion group is women only, right? Correct. And the clubhouse is essentially women only. Um, men can use the pool 
men and children under 18, I think it is, can use the pool from one from noon noon until one, I think something like that, or eleven to one, something like that, just in the middle of the day. So they do have access, but for the rest of the time, it is women only space. Hmm. And, and in Florida, and who wants to be in the pool at noon? <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah. just too hot. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's so, not the ideal time. So the men no. <laughs> and the children, so, it sounds like. So it's an adult. It's a women-only facility for the most part, and also an adult-only facility, mm -hmm. which I think that's got to be really rare. You know, in this in today's world where everyone's always declaring, oh, that's exclusionary. What do you hate children? You know, and <laughs> it's like, no, adult human females love mm -hmm. each other's company and want to be in each other's company that doesn't mean that you're exclusionary mm -hmm. you know and, and they've put the those hours in i think just to you know accommodate people who well especially who have uh, visitors and you know it, it seemed to it's worked now for what 25 years mm -hmm. so there's harmony at carefree living Yes, a lot. Amazingly. Yeah. Women get along. Yes. I mean, you know, one of the things is that we've got a lot of leaders here uh, and we have people who have been the first in their profession. And so they, um, they're they strong. We have some strong personalities and people who are would be considered alpha. And it's amazing how well we've worked together there are times that you know people butt their heads together because they feel passionate about the way something should be but ultimately you know we're able to work things through it's you know we we vote on issues and have an opportunity to speak at the owners meetings and hash out the issues and and vote and so your decision-making process at the community sounds like a democratic one. There's yeah. a, a place where people can speak their opinion and argue for this or that and discuss what the issue is, and then you vote. And Correct. is it majority rule voting and one vote per um, woman, or is it per property? One, one vote per lot. Yeah. Do some women own more than one lot? Yeah, there are a few who own uh, more than one and they tend to rent them out. And um, so do those yeah. renters have an equal voice in decision making? No, no, not, they don't. But it's, it doesn't it's not real cause for strife, it sounds like. No. And, you know, the renters are usually here for the winter season, so they're not here tend not to be your own residents. Uh-huh. And what's it like uh, walking down the street of Carefree on a <laughs> typical day? Like what might what might you see? Like if do you do you walk everywhere or are there cars? Are there golf carts? How do you get around? Well, there are golf carts and bicycles. So we have a number of bicyclists and and some women like nancy just got a, a tricycle a, a recumbent tricycle so there are a number of those around and then people walk and um you know they have cars too but i would say golf carts are pretty common um you know and it's really great because we take a walk every morning and it takes us quite a, a, a while to get around because oftentimes we stop and talk to people. You know, there are a lot of dog owners who are out walking their dogs and, you know, we, we just tend to stop and chat. And, and so it's a very friendly place. One of the things we love about sitting out on our lanai, which is um, up against uh, the street, is we can be out there reading and we, we hear laughter coming from the street so often because people women are walking 
down the street with each other and laughing. And it just gives me such a wonderful feeling for being here. Oh, that's so nice. It sounds a little bit like Mishfest. Did you ever go to the Michigan Women's oh, Music yes. Festival? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's sort of a combination of Mishfest and Olivia Cruz because we have real beds <laughs> and running water and shower, hot showers in our homes and and Girl Scout camp. Yes. So the, it's just the best of, of all these three marvelous uh, gatherings, all women gatherings that have been so important in my life. And, and what's wonderful too is that so many of the women here have been involved in those. I mean, yeah. they've been involved in Girl Scouts and in Mish Fest and various women's music um, music festivals, and and, and, and so they've, they've been on multiple Olivia cruises. So yeah, these these are women who don't want who don't want to live around men. Mm -hmm. they just just love the the whole ambience and and safety and joy in being in a women's community also a number of the women here belong to or have belonged to rv women and, yeah. and they've kind of met up um, around the the country in fact it's kind of funny a lot of them have um rigs and they take off in the spring and they go around the country visiting other carefree women. <laughs> so, so it's like we can't get enough of each other. <laughs> yeah. So some of you become a mobile community yes. in the spring and the summer, and then you come back yeah. in the fall and the winter to nest down in Florida all together, still in a community. That is a perfect description. That's yeah. All. Oh, yeah. sounds really lovely. How did you find out about Carefree? Well, we were on an Olivia cruise a few years ago, and Becky and I love to dance, and especially ballroom dance. And every evening there was a live band and ballroom dancing, so we would go, and we noticed that there were two other couples who were very good dancers. So naturally, we struck up a conversation with them. And where are you from? And they said, oh, well, we're from Carefree. And I said, what's Carefree? She said, you don't know what about Carefree? Oh, my gosh, you have got to come. It's this community of lesbians in Florida. We have dances all the time. You two would love it. <laughs> so as soon as it worked out with our lives, we came here for a month. And we did love it. And we came back another year for three months. And we loved it even more. And the net, we tried to find a place to rent for the following year and there really wasn't anything available. And so we bought a home <laughs> in order to be able to come back. And we're so glad we did because now we can stay for as long as we want to. We have our own, our own possessions with us and, it, and it's home. It feels really more like home now than Minnesota, which is where we lived for so many decades. And we hate being cold. We just hate, <laughs> both of us hate being cold. Every time we had a chance, we came to the Caribbean to, to get warm in the winter. So one of the joys for us is simply that we are never cold. Yeah. And crime, yeah. there's not much crime in your community. Not, not within the community. No, no. Not within the community. Yeah, and, it's and, gated. and it's gated. And yeah. are there, you know, like at Mishfest, there were these Yahoo men that would drive around in their trucks and yell and things like that. Is there no. anything like that? Haven't no. had that. No. And it's been around for 25 years, huh? Yeah. Um, do you think there are other carefree type communities in the United States that we may just not know about because you have to sort of hide away as a lesbian community to, to protect yourself from the larger society? The only one we're aware of is in Arizona and it's called Superstition Mountain. Mm -hmm. And the founders of Carefree actually went there in their RV and wanted to, were thinking about purchasing property there, but they didn't like the landscape. They're from the Midwest and they just 
missed green <laughs> and they had family in the Fort Myers area. And so they were leaving Superstition Mountain, leaving Arizona. And one of them said, you know, we could start a community like that. And the other one said, no, 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 no. I'm not interested in that, that kind of work. Well, by the time they got to the next stage, she'd said, well, what would we have to do to start a community? What would be involved, do you think? And then the first one said, aha, she was hooked. Once she got started asking that questions, question, it was inevitable. And so as far as I know, those are the only two, Arizona and Florida. Mm -hmm. And how long has the one in Arizona been going? Well, it must be longer than 25 years yeah. because they visited it when it was already established. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that there are some women's communities in, in rural areas that are, are really tucked away, but I, I don't know how you find those. Mm -hmm. Well, there are directories of women's land, of well, course. That's but nothing that's so organized or that would have 500 women like there are here. Are there properties currently available? How, how um, fast is the turnover rate at Carefree? <laughs> well, right now, it's the turnover rate is um, instantaneous, practically. <laughs> if someone is, is selling, sometimes before they even get a for sale sign up, someone wants it. So um, it, it's it's rapid turnover. Wow. So there's clearly a demand for this kind of community. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of WLRN listeners would be interested in a community like, like Carefree. And perhaps um, somebody from that community might want to start another one, maybe a younger member of the community mm -hmm. would maybe yeah. want to start another one in a different region of the country. I mean, it'd be great if every state, I mean, it? really, every state should have a community like this. You no, know, every state you know? should. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, and rental properties are very precious as well. You have to, you have to either be lucky or reserve a place a year in advance. To find to find a place to rent, especially during January, February, March, mm -hmm. in the high season. Do you have performers that come through and perform? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and a is lot that of, like Olivia Cruz's? It is. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the people who perform on Olivia Cruz's make a stop here. Alex Dobkin was here two years ago. Oh, yeah. it was so that's grateful. wonderful! Um, and she did a concert and she did a workshop. And it was, it was so grateful How that big we is, were able to see her before she died. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I got to see her at MFR before she died um, in 20, was that 2019? Yeah, the summer of 2019. Um, what is the stage like? How big um, is the capacity for an audience? I think the clubhouse salon holds 200 I think so too. women so for big name performers Suzanne Westenhofer for mm -hmm. example you have to get a ticket early <laughs> in order to mm -hmm. be able to attend and the stage is just a raised platform it's a pretty simple affair but we have a very good sound system people people know how to do sounds and lights so the quality of the of the performances are very high. Which it's, it's sometimes the performers give workshops. Um, you know, yeah. they'll, they'll perform uh, Friday or Saturday night, and then the next day they'll provide a workshop. Like Alex Dobkin, I think, did one on um, humor, and also um, led a discussion on um, trans issues as I recall, and sometimes the, uh, if writers come, they'll give a, a writing workshop. Um, someone gave a, a workshop on writing, writing songs. <laughs> so, so they're oftentimes coupled with uh, some educational component. Would you say that there's something for everyone that you don't have to be a music lover? You could also, maybe you're into sports. Are there 
uh, sports uh, teams that that play there too? Or? Yes, it's um, they're really big on pickleball here, and um, oh, we have a bocce ball court and a shuffleboard court. Every other year, we have what we call Rainbow Olympics, and there's a whole array of of sports, and some of them are kind of made up, uh, like a um, the bean bag toss. Uh, there, there's a uh, competitive game that comes, a team game that comes with that, and uh, table tennis, and you know all sorts of things. So water water polo, yeah, uh, volleyball. So you know people get into teams, and it's a great way to meet people and become friends too. And that goes for right, ten, ten days, ten days, ten days yeah. from morning till night, every yeah. single day. It's intense. Yeah. And you can sign up for as many events as you want to, but um, most people run themselves ragged the first year and then realize they yeah. can't they can't play they can't play nearly as many sports as they would like to during those ten days. And then on alternate years, it's what's called the Winter Games, and those are less athletic and more more games. I mean, there there's a Scrabble competition and <laughs> poker competition and all sorts of different things. Um, so the the ring the ring toss, yeah. yeah. Hmm. And it's also nice because some of these sports will accommodate people who have disabilities. I mean, we've we've seen women who you know take their their canes up to a up to the throwing line and 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 they can throw the ring and so it's great to have you know people of all different levels and abilities. Um, be part of the competition and it's just a lot of fun. There's a year round chair volleyball uh, game that, that I think three times a week at different levels of ability. So people who are in, in wheelchairs or in walkers can participate in chair volleyball as well as younger women. It's, it's apparently, I have never, I've never played it, but apparently it's, it's hilarious. You are listening to WLRN. Wow, so there's, yeah, so there's a whole everyone. there's the whole arts community. Mm -hmm. There is there are two art houses that are stocked full of every kind of art material you could ever want. There are classes in everything from stained glass to painting to mosaics and um, there's a kiln and a very active pottery community, people who, who makes, make ceramics. Beautiful. Oh, <laughs> ceramics. beautiful. There are so many fabulous artists here. And once a year, there is an art show and any carefree woman can enter her work in that art show and sell it or not sell it. So many of the homes here are decorated with beautiful art from other carefree women. Wow, it sounds like a utopia. Um, what, what is, what, what, how many people, how many of the women are white compared to women of color? What kind of diversity range do you have in your population at Carefree? Women of color are very hesitant to move to Florida. This is redneck racist country. So that is one reason um, that the community is the vast majority are white women. Mm -hmm. Is that a topic of discussion at all oh, in the community? Perennially, yes. It's not what we would choose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and there are all sorts of, of efforts to entice more women of color to come, but you don't want to be the first one either. It's hard to join a, a board or an organization or my goodness, a community mm -hmm. when you don't see other people who look like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we, just have, we just have a handful of, of um, blacks right now. And, and I think we've had a few um, Latinos, Latinos. Um, 
Because, right. you know, that was something that I thought Mishfest did really well. They had the women of color tent and yeah, lots. Really well. I remember going in the, early, for me, the early days, which were the, um, it was uh, the early 2000s was when I first went. 1998 was the first time I went. And then the next year was 2000. And that was something that really impressed me, like how many women of color there were and how integrated they were and how they were all represented on the stages too. And then the women of color tent and all of that just really impressed me. Um, so in your community, you haven't achieved what Mishfest achieved. They had to put a lot of work into that <laughs> to, to make that happen. Um, so there are women in your community that are working on in, yeah, yeah and on diversity and increasing yeah. the diversity of the community. Mm -hmm. And um, what about drugs and alcohol use? Are there rules around that? And are there any problems with that in the community? We haven't seen any. Um, there is some active AA group here. And I know just from going to the garden, taking the garbage out, uh, um, there are a lot of beer cans <laughs> in recycling. So, um, yeah, I mean, you have the social drinkers and, and the abstainers. Um, I, I, I don't know anything about the, the drug scene. Um, Although I should say there are a number of, of women who um, take CBD for, um, for pain or you know, various health reasons. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I guess you're asking the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just you know curious about all aspects of the community. Yeah. Um, is there a choir? Yes. Oh, wonderful choir. What's yeah. the name of the choir? Carefree Chorus. <laughs> Carefree Chorus. Very nice. <laughs> and there's a band uh, and it's a, a wonderful band. And uh, the leader is a is Dorothy Kunkel, who was a professional orchestra leader. And so she has really put a lot of work in and grown the band and developed the skills of, of the participants. A lot of the uh, women did, had not picked up an instrument since high school. They were in their high school bands. And for, I mean, we've heard several stories about women, once they got to college, they weren't allowed to be in the band. It was male only. So they just put their instrument away and that was it. And then they came to Carefree 40 years later and someone said, no, here's a band, what do you play? And, and so they would pick up their instrument again. So it's, it's, it's an amazing story that a lot of the women have with the band. In fact, it's so amazing that Becky and I made a documentary about it, about the Carefree Concert Band for the Carefree Film Festival, which happens every okay. other year. And we entered it in the documentary category of this film festival, and it won first place. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Can you watch it like on YouTube? Yes, yeah, it's it's on our it's on our website, which is nambeck.com. Would you please link. send me a link um, that sure, we can put sure. in the write-up uh, for sure. this, for this program? Yeah, so it's such an active community. There's so much going on and it sounds, I mean, what are the major problems? Like I said, it sounds so utopic. What are, what are the problems <laughs> that your community faces, if any? Well, let's see. Um, the biggest one may be hiring staff that is reliable, hardworking, and competent. I think that has been more of a problem maybe before we got here, but we have heard some discussion of the, um, the, the office staff mm -hmm. and 
most of them are from outside the community because people don't come here and then want to work, most of us, or they already have jobs and are working. So we hire, we hire people from Fort Myers to do the administrative tasks or the um, keeping up the grounds of Carefree. And sometimes those people fall down on the job a little bit and then we have to let them go and find somebody else. So that's, that's probably the biggest challenge. Well, I th and I think right now the <laughs> biggest has been COVID. Oh, and well. um, what do we do with the clubhouse and, and should we, you know, back when, when it was just raging through the state, you know, do we close the clubhouse, which we did for a while and no one was allowed in. And then gradually, you know, people wanted it open. We, it's now open, but you have to be masked inside. Uh, and there's still a limit. I think 50 people at most can be in the clubhouse. The limits around the swimming pool have been lifted. That was, that was quite contentious, actually, because people said, you know, we're out of doors. You know, let us, let us use the pool. And, and, but other people said, hey, we don't want COVID in here. If it, if it's in, if it gets in here, given the health and the number of elderly women, it's gonna be, it's gonna be awful. So it's better to be cautious. So that was, um, that mm -hmm. has been the biggest thing. And, and right now the, the pool area is open um, and people don't have mm -hmm. to be masked. And we have more than 10 women in the pool at one time, yeah. which is what the limit was for a long time. Yeah. Do you have to be fully vaccinated to swim in the pool? There's no requirement yeah. for vaccinations, but yet yeah, you yeah, know everybody is it's, yeah. it's yeah. an ongoing thing right um yeah things are no well, not not really every everybody everybody we don't have really it's, it's not a, a trumpist community it's this little haven of democratic political liberals in the midst of trump country mm -hmm. and so everybody masked everybody was mm -hmm. vaccinated Super um, and we have not we're the only community in this whole area that has not had a problem with COVID. You know, it was so typical of being here that when the um, vaccinations first became oh, available, yeah. <laughs> we drew up a, a, a few people, organized a whole list of people with their numbers and would call them because you had to call in to make a reservation to get vaccinated. And, you know, as soon as the, um, the phone lines were open, they started calling in and we had these pods that would call for everyone in that pod. And so they would get, someone could get 14, 16 people in at a time uh, to go in and get their vaccinations. I mean, it was just a great system and so supportive of everyone. I mean, pe people put a lot of effort into that. They would be up um, early in the morning, you know, like five or something, trying to get get reservations, and I mean, it's just uh, and it just came from the heart. Mm -hmm. And so, to your knowledge, uh, there aren't any women there who resist getting the the vaccination, um, because there are people that are not Trump supporters who are reluctant oh, to yes, get the vaccination. So it's very you know, yeah. that, it's a contentious issue amongst yeah, feminists. Um, when yeah. I was at a uh, Michigan family re reunion, there were women that were resistant to getting, reluctant to getting the vaccine and other women who were pro-vaccine and it was causing, a, you know, some sparks to fly a, amongst the community a little bit, not a huge amount, but um, mm. that was, you know, so... People do things differently. What, whatever per, political persuasion you come from, there. When you have a group of people that are all living together communally, um, there there are bound to be some differences. And um, but it sounds like with so many positive activities available, you can channel all of your energy, whatever <laughs> that energy might be, into something positive in this community. Um, who had the original vision for this community? Who? Who are they and what inspired them? 
Kathy Groney from, Colum from Cincinnati and her partner, Gina Rossetti from Cincinnati, a photographer. Kathy had a, uh, was a professional photographer and had her own photography shop. And Kathy was a real estate agent. They were the two who visited Superstition Mountain in Arizona and got the idea for Carefree and they did it. They, they bought the property and they, they went to Mishfest and, and music festivals and they just traveled all over in those first years trying to interest women in Carefree before, before they broke ground. And so that they had a little bit of capital on hand with women who were willing to take a chance with the, the promised that um, if they changed their mind, they would get every penny back. And so they, they were able to build the clubhouse. So when women came to see what Carefree was like, there would at least be a clubhouse and a few uh, spec houses. And then it grew faster than their wildest imaginations. But one wonderful thing they did was to incorporate into the whole design of Carefree their ideal of community. So they made it they made it easy and and just the just the design it feels sort of female. There are no straight streets. Everything here is is rounded and curvy. Um, the you know the streets meander around in a circle. There are two big circles, and then there are circles off of the circles, and there are two lakes in the midst of each of the two big circles. So we have a lot of uh, conservation area. So there's a little bit of wilderness in that, that almost all of the homes have some kind of access to a, a late water or, or just a, a forest. And they, they also had safety in mind. They buried the cables instead of putting them on poles because of hurricane danger. So carefree, has survived hurricanes partly because the cables are underground and also because they brought in a million dollars of fill and raised the level three feet above flood level. So all of the communities around us may flood and do flood and Carefree is high and dry. So they, they just did it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Getting back to politics, I, I have to ask, because, you know, Mishfest was divided from within due to the trans issue. Are there trans activists that live at Carefree that are pushing for men to be included or um, any of that? Not so far. So far, no. no. Yeah. Great. That's the end of that, then. And we don't well. even have to talk about that, which... Whew. <laughs> well, I think there, there are some women who would be open to having trans women here. And there are other women who say, no way. <laughs> That's not why we came here. Not, um, we trans, trans women are men, and we have chosen not to be with men. And so there are different opinions on that topic and we've not had to put anything to the test yet um, as far as a trans woman wanting to to be here or trans activists or trans activists yeah, yeah. yeah. At all. you know yeah. it, it, it's that's the advantage of having to buy in having you know making it your the your place of residence whereas mm -hmm. Mishfest was temporary and so yeah. it was e much easier for men to invade Mishfest than um, having to put in a full investment into either renting or buying a home. Mm -hmm. so, um, That's true. Hmm. And so really, it, in order to get into the community, you, women don't have to go through an interviewing process with all of the other residents that live there, right? They, do they have to be vetted in some way or do they just have to have the money to buy the property or to pay the rent? They have to have the money to buy the property, but to belong to the clubhouse, that is a different corporation 
So in order to belong to the clubhouse, you do go through an interview process. And that was one of the clever ways that they set this up because who would want to buy a property if you can't use the clubhouse? Um, legally, legally, you can't discriminate against men and anybody should, can buy property mm -hmm. here. But the private clubhouse is private. Is private. And, and that's, that's one of the ways that we can try to keep it an all women's community. Interesting. So when you have the money to buy a property and let's say the property is available, um, in order to use the clubhouse, you have to go through an interviewing vetting process. You can still buy the property, but the clubhouse, since it's legally a private entity, can say, no, we're not going to, we, you don't meet these criteria, or maybe just no, you know, this is a private clubhouse. And has that ever happened? So far, you said no, it really has. I, I don't believe it has. But also, you know, if, if we have someone who is disruptive, I've not heard of that happening, but it's in the bylaws that if someone is disruptive at the uh, clubhouse um, on an ongoing basis, they can be denied uh, access to the club, clubhouse. They can be kicked out. And, you know, that's, it's such a, uh, important part of the community here that, you know, you, that's not something that you want to ha happen. Right. So that's incentive to, for women to be on their best behavior and to well, enjoy yeah. each other's company and be kind yeah. and considerate yeah. and, oh, sounds so lovely. Is there anything? Do you want to come, come visit us, Thistle? Oh, absolutely. I should play. I, I'd love to play a show in the clubhouse. Okay. You know, I just released an album. Oh, of music of original music. Yeah. Spinning and weaving. Um, oh, I announced yeah. it on one of the shows and then it's been on our Facebook page and stuff, but I'm not much of a marketer. <laughs> I like to make the music, but during COVID I was unemployed. And so I had a lot of time on my hands and a friend from high school, we both were really musical in high school, and he uh, plays every instrument and has a recording studio in his basement. And so we entered into an agreement, both of us had time on our hands, and I made this 12 song, really beautiful um, oh. album called Spinning and Weaving to go along with the Spinning and Weaving Radical Feminist Anthology that Elizabeth Miller out of the Chicago Feminist Salon published this this year um so yeah i would love to come visit your community and play at the clubhouse that would be super super rad well, you know we'll, we'll <laughs> let the events people know about that um, okay i'll send you my information about the new album so that you can yeah, check sure. out and everything sure. and be sure to send me links of the things that you were referring to including your books okay um, so that I can put that in the write-up uh, in the description for this interview that we're gonna post. Okay. So, is there anything else you'd like to say to our WLRN listeners, largely lesbian and radical feminists uh, living in the USA? We do have some Canadian women who listen and also women over in the UK and, and in other countries, but primarily it's an American lesbian feminist and uh, radical feminist. Uh, media service. Anything you'd like to say to our audience? Well, part? one thing is that we do have some Canadian women come um, every winter, and we even have a couple from the Netherlands who own here, and they they come. They haven't been here, of course, since COVID, but uh, um, that's always fun to see them. So we we do have a few a few tentacles outside of the U.S. Nice. Anything else for you, Nance? Um, only to emphasize what a what a rare and special place the resort on Carefree Boulevard is to help people my age. 
75 to, or, or any age really, to thrive. So many, so many people, including me, after I retired and after I had some health challenges, was sort of looking at a downward trajectory. And in the three years that we have lived at Carefree, my health has improved tremendously. And I'm engaged in so many things from the Carefree Book Club, monthly book club, to we become filmmakers. I never imagined I would be a filmmaker uh, or, or that I would re-release two books. Well, one, the Girl Scout book this year and the nonfiction book is going to be re-released next year. But it's as if I have gotten an infusion of meaningful, loving, supportive energy at Carefree that I cannot imagine happening in any place other than a women's community where everyone, everyone knows the, the references. Out in the world, it's so out in the world. <laughs> out in the world, if you say Meg Christian or Chris Williamson, well, people probably don't even know who you're talking about. And it's so, it's so wonderful to have shared cultural and political references to have so many women here who identify as radical lesbian feminists. Where else, except at Mishfest or maybe on an Olivia cruise, would you find that kind of political and emotional and cultural communion? <laughs> and, and another aspect too is that we have so many resources here. We've got women who come from all walks of life and um, I mean, just with our books alone, you know, I've, um, we have a wonderful um, graphic artist who does book design. And so she makes it so easy for those of us who are writers to get our books into print or into eBooks. And uh, I mean, there are people here, I mean, if, if, if you don't have the, um, the right tool, the right size, screwdriver, you know, all you have to do is walk out the front door and say, you know, as someone comes down the street, you know, do you have a, a, a Phillips screwdriver that's you know smaller than this one? And I mean, there's just a, all the resources and, and everyone is, seems to be so helpful. It's, um, and, and the sharing of, of knowledge, you know, who who's uh, really good at cleaning gutters and um, you know who do you use to clean the house or who do you use to um, you know we need we need some work done with the, the plumbing or you know all we have to you know we've got a Facebook page and so all someone has to do is say you know who's a good pul pulmonologist yeah well, all the people who love their pulmonologist yeah. reply so, you know, so we've got that, you know, all the resources close at hand, both in, in our community and then outside in the greater um, community the, for the, well, the doctors and so forth. So it's, it's just a, a wonderful place. So, so that's, not yeah. really, well, well, that's not a message for lesbian, <laughs> radical lesbian feminists necessarily, but it's, it's just more of our raving about yeah. how happy we are here. And, yeah, and, <laughs> and just women supporting women and women running our own community. I mean, we, that's one of the great things and inspiring things of, of our clubhouse and our, um, uh, our, the board meetings. You know, it's women running the show. <laughs> And, you know, we are self-reliant and um, it's, you know, we have our own power here. It sounds like women's liberation theory put into practice. It is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and true. it makes me feel better, even though I don't get to live there right now, um, just to know that, that it exists. Mm -hmm. And and that it's safe and and you know it's not under attack and that it's got 25 years under its belt and so there's in this the turnover and the longevity of the project it just seems like you've got what it takes to keep going and um, that makes me feel better 
in the world, just knowing that a place like that exists. So thank you for sharing the details of what you experienced there um, to really paint a picture for us uh, to get an idea of what it's like. And yes, I would totally love to visit, probably in the wintertime because you're up in Minnesota um, in the spring and summer, right? So sometime in the winter, that would be perfect for me to escape the cold Northland um, in the winter. <laughs> so sure. thank you again. Thank you okay, thanks, for Rachel. inviting us to, to talk about this. And thank you for all the wonderful work you do. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in to another extended WLRN interview. My guests today were Becky Bowen and Nancy Manahan. And I'm Thistle Patterson, founding member of WLRN a little feminist collective that's been going strong now for over half a decade. If you'd like to learn more about Nancy and Becky's extensive work as authors, you can visit their website at nanbeck.com. That's N-A-N-B-E-C.com, where you will find a listing of their books and videos that they've created. Thanks for staying tuned to WLRN, your feminist community powered radio station in the Femisphere. Sisters, my sisters. I'll see you next time. This is Thistle Pedersen signing off.